you know, honestly, I wanted to just kind of leave everyone with some practical tips. Because Allah Azza wa tells us in the Qur'an that those who seek huda, guidance, will be guided. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulihi al-kareem wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathira. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, I'm going to try to inshallah ta'ala make it short. I'm not going to go longer than Maghrib, so I won't go more than 30 minutes inshallah ta'ala. And, you know, honestly, I wanted to just kind of leave everyone with some practical tips. Because I know that one of the things that usually happens is when you go to a convention, when you go to a conference, wow, that talk was mind-blowing. That was awesome. Did you hear what, what, what Brother Nu'man said? Did you hear what this, what this speaker said? Did you hear what Brother Omar said? Did you hear what Brother Qasim said? What did you... Did you hear that? Did you hear what Dr. Arif said? But at the end of the day, uh, we really don't make much change. There isn't really much practicality. Sometimes that's the fault of the speakers. Um, sometimes that's the fault of the listeners. Um, and here's the thing. I know that this topic has probably been regurgitated hundreds of times under the guise of different titles, different khutbas, how I can change now. But you know, Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he said something very powerful. Because Allah Azza wa tells us in the Qur'an that those who seek huda, guidance, will be guided. Those who seek it will be guided. So essentially what Allah Azza wa tells us is that if you really want to change, then the first thing is that you have to want to, if you really want to change, then the first thing is that you have to recognize that there is something about you that needs to be changed. Looking at yourself, Recognizing those things, as Brother Nu'man said, not blaming anyone else for anything. Not looking at the world and, and, and suffering from analysis paralysis, you know, where we'll just sit around and complain and whine. And the same brother that's talking about how terrible everything is in, is in Gaza and how terrible everything is in Pakistan and Africa is the same one who won't, do, who won't put forth even an hour's worth of volunteering towards his masjid or towards any Islamic cause. But I want to really focus more on the individual. I think Brother Nu'man covered very well the idea of a society, you know, how we, how we can change as a community. But if a person is changed, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, inshallah, through that person, would change many things in the community. So it starts with each and every single one of us. Here's the thing. If you want to change, Imam al-Ghazali rahimahullah, he says something beautiful. He says, إِذَا الْمَرْءُ كَانَتْ لَهُ فِكْرَةً فَفِي كُلِّ شَيْءٍ لَهُ عِبْرَةً When a person is really deeply involved in some sort of thought, when something is, is heavy on his mind, heavy on his heart, then everything around him will be a guide towards that thing. Let me put it to you this way. Uh, how many of you guys have met annoying newlyweds? Raise your hands. How many of you guys are annoying newlyweds? Nobody? No, I don't think so. I was about to call you out, good call. None of you are annoying. You know the people that go around and all of a sudden you, you put like a thousand pictures on your Facebook the day after your wedding. And I'm like, shouldn't you be doing something else the day after your wedding? <laughs> and uploading a thousand pictures. And, and it's like you've got these cute little shirts that point to each other. And there's thing one and thing two. And I'm hers and I'm his and all that kind of stuff. And it's like people really don't care that much about your life. But anyway, the, the thing is, is that whenever you fall in love, or whenever a person gets engaged. Let me tell you what happens from a guy's perspective. One day, this same guy wants to play basketball all the time. Wants to always hang out. Annoys his married friends because he's not understanding enough to understand that the married guy has to get home by midnight. Wants to go hang out all the time and every, you know, at any time of the day. Then all of a sudden he gets engaged and he never answers his cell phone again. Until a year later, whenever he wants to run away from his wife. <laughs> and he wants to hang out again. Look for an excuse to hang out, right? <laughs> but the point is, is when that person is in love, when that person is overwhelmed, when that person is overcome, when that person is really in that mood, subhanAllah, everything they look around, everything they see around them reminds them of love, right? Like, oh, that empty paper cup in the parking lot. It's so beautiful. Look how it just goes with the wind. I wish I could be that paper cup in her house and just float around and all that stuff. You know, like all that. Here's the thing. You love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, everything around you has meaning all of a sudden. Every single thing. You really have a sense of urgency 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will show you the way to change. Because you know what? At the end of the day, it's different for everybody. All of us have our different demons. Including me, including Brother Nu'man, including Brother Qasim, including Dr. Arif, including all of us. We've all got our own set of problems. And every single problem has its specific solution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who guides you to that. But the first thing you have to have is a sense of urgency. Don't worry about anyone else. Don't worry about what other people are doing. As Imam Hassan al-Basi rahimahullah said, Rahimallahu imra'an shagalathu uyubuhu an uyub nas May Allah have mercy on a person who is too busy with his own faults to be worried about anybody else's faults. A sense of urgency. I've got to make my relationship right with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I'm going to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala maybe tomorrow. It could be very, very, very soon. I need to make sure that when I meet him, I'm prepared for that interview. So here's what I'm going to give you because I know that we all have practicality issues with some of the uh, lectures. So I just typed up five things. These are five tips. If you want to take notes, you can. If you don't take notes in lectures, then you waste your time in most of your lectures. The first one. Eliminate the poisons in your life that aren't allowing you to change. How many of you guys have ever seen a person? Um, I know I deal with bums all the time, right? Anyone who deals in relief work or in, in imams, any imam or something like that, you'll always have the guy that, you know, that was a loser from a dunya perspective. And usually when you're a loser from a dunya perspective, you're also not very disciplined spiritually. Walks into the masjid reeking of alcohol. Brother, you know, I thought we agreed you're going to make a change. I thought that something was going to happen. Oh, I'm a changed man. I go home more now. I go to work every single day. What's he not recognizing? The alcohol, right? The same way spiritually. You have to recognize the poisons in your life that will prevent you from coming close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do you really think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to give you khushu' in your salah when your eyes have been all over the place all day and all of a sudden you think you're going to go to salah and salah is going to be okay? You really think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to allow you to enjoy that relationship with Him? If right before salah you were sitting on Gchat and Facebook or whatever and, and you know, you're chatting with whoever it is and then two minutes left in salah time, Asr's at 4.38, it's 4.36, BRB, gotta go make salah, right? Then you put a smiley face or something like that, you go hurry up and rush and make your salah, and come back, and you write, FML, almost missed my salah, <laughs> or something like that. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, the uncles don't understand that one. <laughs> don't work on that acronym, okay? The point that I'm trying to say is, you really think Allah is gonna give you change like that? You really think your khushu' will mean anything? That you'll be able to get any khushu' out of that? And essentially what that teaches us is that the Prophet wasallam he taught us about this heart, this qalb. Imam al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says what? Your qalb is a space. You fill it up with, you fill it up with anything else, you're not, going to be, you're not going to have any space for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in there. So the very first thing, the very first step to making that change as an individual, eliminate the things in your life that are a hindrance to you uh, excelling in your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Get rid of those things before you go do good deeds. You know what, like an Imam Sufyan al-Thawri rahimahullah said, a very beautiful statement. He was asked, where's the priority? Istighfar or tasbih? Doing good deeds or seeking forgiveness? And he said, if you have a dirty thawb, you don't accessorize it, you clean the stain. You clean the stain, you wash the stain off. If you got a big old brown stain on your white shirt and you go and you put $200 cufflinks on, people are not going to notice the cufflinks. People are going to look at the stain. Get rid of the stains. Then you can start talking about all these, all these things that you can do. And unfortunately, you know, subhanAllah, spirituality, the notion of spirituality. So this, this concept of progressive Islam slash just spirituality and ignoring the commands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is essentially the same thing that the Christians did. Essentially what Paul proposed. It allows you to act as a fool your entire life. Not do anything in accordance with the Qur'an and the Sunnah, but to do like something super spiritual so that you can feel good about yourself. So essentially what you're doing is you're giving to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what you want to give Him, not what He wants you to give Him. You know, I'll go and I'll pray and I'll do this extra qiyam. The problem is not the qiyam. The problem is that you're doing the things that will stop your qiyam from being accepted. The problem is not your dua. 
The problem is what you do after dua and before dua. That's the problem that you're having. Eliminate the stains from your life and then you would find that you naturally would start to come close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because once your heart becomes clean and honest, your heart starts naturally inclining towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Your fitrah is to incline towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So eliminate the things that corrupt your fitrah. Number two, an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. You know, some people, subhanAllah, they wait for really, really, really bad things to happen. They wait to see the consequences of their sins before they change those things. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. What happens is that shaitan claws you, he digs you into this hole, or you dig yourself into this hole. It's a lot harder to climb out of that hole than to have taken care of it in the first place. And Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says, and I want you to think about this, prevention. Before you commit mistakes, you know, some people subhanAllah are just very weak. We're all weak, right? But some people just wait to mess up and then I'll try to figure it out. Put aside the flaws you already have, don't go any further. And Imam Al-Qayyim rahimahullah, he says that every single action that you commit, every single sin that you commit goes through the following stages. Number one, it's a fatra, passing thoughts. Number two, after it's a passing thought, it becomes a fikrah, settled thought. You start thinking about it. Hey, what about that? You know, shaitan caught your gaze with something. He, caught some, he got you with some sort of interest. Let me start thinking about this. You start to entertain that thought. You were not strong enough to cut off yourself before you could entertain that thought. You know, some people, subhanAllah, immediately the instinct, because their iman has become strengthened, it takes a long time to really, to, to raise yourself, to purify yourself. The minute that something walks by, or the minute that they see something, or that they're approached by something that's haram, immediately they go into istighfar. There's no time there for that. I mean, the, the amount of time, the time that lapses before they do istighfar and go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is very small. Some people, passing thought, then I start entertaining the thought. After I've entertained the thought enough, shaitan has told me about how great the benefits of this action are going to be. And essentially, we commit sin because we think that it's going to serve some sort of benefit to us. We think it's going to give us some sort of pleasure. And it usually does for a temporary time. Then it becomes a niyyah. I have the intention to commit that sin. After I have the niyyah, the intention to commit that sin, once I've made the intention to commit something, nothing's going to stop me. Then it becomes azimah. I'm determined to commit that sin. No matter what stops me. Right? At first, I was very hesitant. Now I'm full force. You know, I'll give you an example. There was a sister that I knew that wanted to take off her hijab just to rebel against her father. That's, that was the only reason she wanted to throw off her hijab. She was telling my wife, she was saying the first day she went to school, she felt so uncomfortable without her hijab that she threw her hoodie on. She didn't wear hijab, but she threw her hoodie on. Next thing you know, the hoodie came off. A few days, right? I have the intention. Next thing you know, then the tank tops came, then the cleavage came, then the short skirts came too. Why? Because you start becoming determined then to commit that sin. Your heart became hardened to that. That sin has become humanized to you. Hey, this isn't so bad. You became an addict. And that's why once you have azimah, it becomes amal. It surfaced. It became action. Once it becomes action, it becomes ada, becomes a bad habit. Once you have a systemized sin in your life, trust me, that will kill your dua, that will kill your salah, that will kill your, uh, your opportunity to get close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why from the dua that we, that we make, Allahumma naqina min al-dhunubi wal khataya allati takbisu dua wa naqina min al-dhunubi wal khataya allati tanzilu al-bala. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us from the sins and from the mistakes that cause our duas to be cut off. And that caused the anger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to descend upon us. If you keep on with a bad habit, if you keep on with a sin, I want you to think about this, subhanAllah. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells us that at one point you become defined by your sin. Just like at one point you become defined by your good deed. In Bukhari, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said that a person would tell the truth so much, he would be so truthful, hatta yuktab Allah siddiqa till he's written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Siddiq. Not that he told the truth one time. This is a truthful person. This is someone who's truthful in his faith. And then a person would lie so much, not that he told a lie here or there, until he's written with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a Kathab, 
Your name with Allah is a liar. SubhanAllah. You become defined by your traits. You become defined by your deeds. So the second thing, dear brothers and sisters, again, is that an ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Stop yourself before you fall into those situations. Number three. I just typed these up, by the way, so I'm using my iPhone. I'm sorry. Number three. Anyone ever heard of the acronym KISS? Nobody? Keep it simple, stupid. That's what it means. Now, because some brothers always get offended whenever I say that in khutbas, I changed it to keep it simple, sunnah. Just to make it okay for everybody. Some brothers are like, brother, you should have said keep it simple, smart. Don't insult your brothers. Okay, keep it simple, sunnah. We can all agree upon that. Rasulullah tells us that when a person goes to his grave, in Surah an nasai that he would, it's not that he's going to want to come back and he's going to want to establish Khilafah. He's going to wish he would have a moment to come back and establish Khilafah and liberate Palestine, those types of things. Or, you know, build a new masjid and those types of things. Yes, those are great things. I'm not saying those are bad things. But when you go to your grave, what are the things that you're praying for? What are the things that you miss? What do you really want? He would come back and wish he could just offer two rakas. It's two more rakas. So that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala might forgive him with those two rakas. Find something small in your life that you're capable of doing and stick with it. Eventually that will accumulate. Eventually that might be the cause of you entering into Jannah. Subhanallah. When a person finds something small that he can do. I can't change the situation in Palestine right now. I can at least try to change it right now in my own community. I can at least do something here. You know, subhanAllah, in most masajid, whenever there are the, the new board elections and the new committee elections and things of that sort, you have like 30 committees that are formed. Right? And brothers bring out their nice agendas. I don't know the politics of any of masajid here, by the way. None. So you can't accuse me of being, being involved in anything here. But usually what happens in every masjid, brothers bring out their long agendas. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. This is what we're going to do. Three months later, wait, I'm on a committee? <laughs> you know? What are you talking about? I didn't know that. People completely forget what they committed to. That's why the Prophet ﷺ said, what is Aisha radiallahu anha narrated? That the most beloved actions to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adwamuha and qalla. You know, the most consistent of them, even if they're very, very, very small. I'm going to give you guys a story. Actually, do I have time? I have time to tell this story, inshallah. I'll give you guys this story. And Imam al Jawzi rahimahullah. He wrote a book about Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah, Manaqib Ahmad, the, the virtues of Imam Ahmad rahimahullah ta'ala. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah at the time of, at, at, at the peak of his life, before the fitna started, even after the fitna started, was the most famous man in the Muslim ummah. Hands down. In fact that Imam al dhahbi rahimahullah says this was the largest janazah that took place. In a matter of one day, he died and he was buried in the same day. You had 1.3 million people come and pray janazah on him. That's more than the Pope. More than Pope John Paul with all the, all the media and holding his body out. Imagine how popular and beloved he was. Imam Ahmad rahimahullah used to go around to his students' halaqahs, used to go around seeking knowledge from other people, wrapping his face so people wouldn't notice him. Very humble person because he didn't want people to put him on a pedestal. One day he was traveling to a sham, to Syria. What's, what we would call Syria today, but of course it's Syria, Palestine, Lebanon, and Jordan. Asham. And he tells the story, and of course back then, you know, you don't, Imam Ahmed rahimahullah didn't have a Facebook page. <laughs> he didn't know how he looked. He walks into a masjid to spend the night. And the hadith, the guard of the masjid, tells him, get out. The masjid's closing. He said, but I have nowhere to go. I don't know where to go. He said, get out. Ukhruj. Get out. The masjid's closing. He didn't sit there and say, by the way, I'm Imam Ahmed. No, he didn't play that card. Just get out. So Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, picked up his stuff and he slept on the steps of the masjid. The Harris came and started, hey, move. Go, you can't even sleep here. Go, move away. Imam Ahmed's like, where am I going to go? I don't know anything. This man, not knowing who he's messing with, picks up Imam Ahmed rahimahullah by his legs and he drags him to the middle of the street and drops him. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah is like, okay. Then what happens? A baker who owns a bakery right across the street, he comes to Imam Ahmed, he says, you can come sleep in my bakery. Tonight I'm going to be doing some work, you can come sleep here. So he opens the way for him. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah observes this man. 
he's sitting there and he's, you know, putting the dough together and he's putting in the oven. And everything that he does while he's kneading the dough, he's going, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, La ilaha illallah, Allah Akbar, Subhanallah. The entire night, he's making tasbih. Imam Ahmed is shocked. Usually people get tired of tasbih after two minutes, three minutes. He's shocked. This guy is constantly making tasbih at his workplace. He's not sitting in that, just at his workplace. He has nothing better to do, right? Back then, they didn't have little Wayne or Umm Kulthum. You know, or, or Junaid Jamshad pre what we know he is now, right? He didn't have his iPod or anything. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, Allahu Akbar. Constantly. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah goes, how long have you been in this situation? He says, what situation? Making tasbih to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, my whole life, this is what I do. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah, he says, what have you seen from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a result of all this tasbih that you make? All these days that you make tasbih, obviously Jannah. And imagine Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tells us each one of these is planting trees and mansions in Jannah. You can imagine what this man has with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Talk about change, right? But he says, مَا دَعُوتُ اللَّهَ لِشَيْءٍ إِلَّا أَعْطَانِي إِيَّا I never made dua to Allah for anything except that he answered it. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said, Subhanallah, ma da'awtu Allah li shay illa a'taka iya. You never made dua to Allah except He gave it to you? He repeated, I never made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for anything except that He gave it to me. He said, except for one thing. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah said, what is that? He said, an ara al-imam Ahmed. <laughs> to have a chance to see Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed rahimahullah was brought to tears. He embraced this man. But then he said, Subhanallah, Ha huwa Allah, Qad ja'aka bi Ahmad, Yajurruhu bi rijlihi ila makhbazik. He said, Here is Allah. He brought you Ahmad, dragging him by his feet to your bakery. If it wasn't for you, I could have slept in peace at the masjid. <laughs> Subhanallah, think about that. Tasbih. He made use of his time. How much time do you kill at, the, at a red light going to work? How much time do you kill in front of the TV? How much time do you waste of your life that you could be planting trees and palaces in Jannah? That's change. Keep it simple. Sunnah. Have, have a wird. Have a wird. Not one of these wirds that's made up by some sheikh somewhere that you're going to be doing. No. Go to the sunnah of the Messenger وسلم, and that's sufficient. Find the things that he used to do on a daily basis sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and incorporate that in your life. So that's number three. Keep it simple. Sunnah. Number four, think progress. Why do I say this is so important? How many times do we see a sister that says, I don't think I can wear hijab anymore, or I'm not going to wear hijab because I feel like a hypocrite, because I don't even pray right? Yeah, I've seen it a lot. I, I feel like a hypocrite. I feel two-faced when I wear hijab, because I know that I'm not really what people think of me. We've seen that a lot. I don't even pray my five times, my five prayers on time. I just, I can't do this. I'd be a hypocrite. Look how shaitan gets you. He makes you think backwards. Or the brothers in my community who always do this. Let me tell you what the greatest cop out of not going to hajj is. But Shaykh, I work in haram. How can I use my money and I can and go to hajj and then come back and work in haram? So instead of getting rid of haram, I'm just not going to go to hajj. Convenient thinking. Instead of fixing my internal life, I'm just never going to wear hijab. Right? Or how many times have you heard this question? Is it halal to fast if you don't pray? Any of you heard that question before? A lot of times. A lot of times. I hear it all the time. And you know some shiukh, they say, no, that person should fear Allah. He's not even a Muslim. He shouldn't be fasting. He should start praying first. These types of things. Why don't you start praying and add that so that your fast can become validated? SubhanAllah, think progress, don't think backwards. Shaytan always pulls you this way. I didn't mean you by the way, it just happened the phone happened to be coming at the same time. Shaytan always pulls you this way, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala always calls you forward. Make progress. The most profound lecture I've ever heard in my life, Arabic or English, I was going through my old uh, tapes, cassette tapes, by the way, I don't, I don't listen to lectures in English anymore. Honestly, I can't. 
SubhanAllah, I love listening to lectures in Arabic. I just, that's my own personal inclination. There's one person who always does it for me, Imam Siraj Wahaj, Hafidhullah. One lecture I found, he did this khutbah in the 80s called Islam Means Progress. It was my cassette. I popped it in my car. Alhamdulillah, I don't drive a new car. So I still have a cassette player. Popped it in my car. Islam Means Progress. One of the greatest lectures I've ever heard in my life. If you can find it online, find it. I don't know if it's been transcribed or it's been put in an MP3. Islam means progress. Number four is to think forward. Number five, and this is my last thought, inshallah ta'ala, um, because I promised you I'd finish on time, and I've been trying to be good with that recently. Uh, one time a convert, two years ago, um, he converted to Islam in the Amarat, actually, in the UAE. British convert. And subhanAllah, he was reflecting on the manners of the Muslims. And he said something very profound, and I saw it repeated on, on Facebook a few times and things of that sort. He said, on your way to becoming a good Muslim, don't become a crappy human being. SubhanAllah. <laughs> becoming a more religious person should not make you a jerk. It should not make your character worse. It should not make you more condescending towards people. It should make you, more, make you more humble. It should make you more loving. It should make you more compassionate. It should make you more caring. Don't become a terrible person on your way to becoming a good Muslim. It starts off just as I was saying with your parents. You know, subhanAllah, Rasulullah tells us what? What's going to be judged on the day of judgment? Your khuluq. That's the heaviest thing. That's the heaviest thing. Your character. And when you have nasty manners, that is a reflection that on the inside you are actually devoid of iman. Because if we look at the woman who the Prophet ﷺ mentioned, who prayed a lot of prayers, fasted her fasts, did all the rituals, did all the good things, but she was abusive to her neighbor. Let me put, you, let me put this in perspective for you. And we shouldn't be judging other people. The Prophet ﷺ was making an example of this woman. We, it's not our job to do this, but let me put, let me put this in perspective for you. You know, a person who was extremely religious and foremost and coming to the masjid all the time and doing all the halakas, if they have bad manners, if they have a bad attitude, the most you would say is you'd say that person might get called out on the day of judgment for their bad attitude. But you know, alhamdulillah, they still do this, they still do that. And we're supposed to make excuses for other people. We're not sp That's our job. We make excuses for other people. We just don't make excuses for ourselves. But the Prophet ﷺ said what about this woman? What did he say? Someone tell me. No one remembers this hadith? The woman who abused her neighbor, who was abusive to her neighbors with her tongue. She didn't go beat them up. She just was abusive to her neighbors with her tongue. She prayed, she fasted, she did what she was supposed to do from a ritualistic standpoint. What did Rasulullah say about her? Brothers or sisters? She's in hellfire. He said something else too. Rasulullah said, لا خير فيها هي في النار. There is no good inside of her. She's in hellfire. Think about that. لا خير فيها. There is nothing inside of her that's good. هي في النار. All of that was, was superficial. What really counts is when your inner beauty changes. That will reflect with your outer beauty too. And that's why Rasulullah taught us when we look in the mirror, we say Allahumma. We ask Allah for change every time we look in the mirror. When you change your clothes, you ask Allah for a different type of change. What do you say? Allahumma kama ahsanta khalqi, the way you beautified my appearance, you know, you gave me these clothes, you allowed me to change into this new pair of clothes, you created me, you know, with, with some form of symmetry. What do you say next? Ahsin khuluqi, correct, beautify my inside. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us amongst those who experience real change, who search for guidance and who are guided by his mercy. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullahu khayran. Aqulu qawri hadha wa astaghfirullahi wa lakum. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.